For the past two weeks, I've been bombarded with messages about AT&T. So this week, I'm just going to go through it as quickly as I can and tell you why I'm not selling it. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome back everyone, my name's Paul. Now about two weeks ago, AT&T decided to spin off HBO Max and Time Warner into a merger with a company called Discovery. As far as we know, this is going to leave AT&T on its own with this new company, maybe it's called Warner Discovery, we don't really know yet. But it's essentially going to split the two up and the other big news within this was that AT&T were going to cut its dividend, they kind of snuck that in there a little bit sneakily. This caused on the next day of the announcement, loads of really high profile people to start suggesting that they're going to sell out of AT&T. Particularly here on YouTube, I saw tons of different people who I thought really understood the business immediately selling. Like I've got no problem with somebody selling a business because the business fundamentals have changed. But as far as I can see right now, these people sold the next day out of AT&T simply because of the dividend cut. I had no intention of doing that and I want to know if AT&T is worth staying in. That's why it's taken me about two weeks now to figure out exactly what the best plan is going forward. And panic selling at a loss is not for me. The news of this spin-off should not have been a super surprise to any AT&T investors. Scott Galloway has been banging on about this for well over a year now. So we always needed to know that this was a possibility, but the merger with Discovery and what that could open up has really changed things, and in my opinion, for the better. So now a couple of weeks on, I've got a much clearer picture to make a decision on what my money's gonna do with these two companies going forward. There's no doubt about it, the way you have to look at AT&T right now is as two separate companies. Warner Media makes up about 18% of AT&T right now, and that equates to about 8 billion that goes onto AT&T's income statement. So effectively spinning off Warner Media, it loses about 8 billion in cash flow a year. And this leaves AT&T as a pure play communications company with a hell of a lot of debt, a cut dividend, and not a lot of growth going forward. And for this deal, AT&T receives about 43 billion in various different ways cash, but essentially most of it just gets rid of its debt, which could be an extremely good move for AT&T. You see, the communication sector, the prepaid wireless and broadband and all of that hasn't got much room to grow in general. Most of the time, companies like AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile are just trying to nick customers off each other. The whole sector is growing very slowly with AT&T right at the top, so everyone's competing for quite a small market share. The competition is seriously high in the latest C-band auctions, which basically allows each of these companies to provide the best 5G coverage. Essentially, the more of these tiny little 5G towers that you get to build, the better your connection is and the better service you can provide to your customer. And so far, Verizon has spent the most amount of money on C-Band, followed by AT&T, followed by T-Mobile. But it's getting extremely expensive and these three companies cannot afford to keep taking out more and more debt just to provide to the end consumer. AT&T is well known to have an enormous amount of debt, especially as it's made all those massive deals in the past and they haven't really paid off. But AT&T's debt still only makes up 49% of its capital. Verizon also has a tremendous amount of debt. It doesn't make as much money as AT&T, but all of that injected capital has been spent on improving their communication services. So Verizon right now may be a much better bet in communications. And it isn't very different for T-Mobile either. They all have massive amounts of debt in comparison to their balance sheet with T-Mobile only sitting at a double B credit rating. However, this is very likely to improve as T-Mobile grows and takes more market share in mobile and broadband, things like that. So the story with this sector is you've got to be able to spend more on C-Band in order to gain more customers later and take them off the others. And that's what this 43 billion is all about, getting rid of some of that debt so AT&T can become more competitive, the most competitive, in the space of 5G. And AT&T is very, very, very open about its debt. It's got a full list of all of its debt dating all the way to 2097. Yeah, AT&T has debts that mature 
a hundred years from now. It's not a hundred years from now, but it's more dramatic if I say it's a hundred years from now. And very similar to Verizon and T-Mobile, most of AT&T's debt comes after 2022. So in 2022, it's got about 40 to 50 billion of debt that it needs to have paid off. at and short-term interest expenses are about 8 billion a year. It's a very similar amount to how much Warner Media was paying into the company. And if at and can get picky about its debt and take out some of the higher coupon loans that they have, and if you include the dividend cut, they can now reduce their interest payments by about 4 to 8 billion a year which in turn would make them the largest C-band owner and therefore the largest 5G provider in the US. So the story with AT&T now is it's going to be a very flat stock for a very long time. This side of the business now isn't going to have that nice PE expansion. It's probably likely to give you that 5% dividend a year plus one or 2% in capital appreciation. I don't like bringing emotions into this part of the analysis, but the truth is a lot of people are going to have their income cut by about 30%. Real long-term income investors for AT&T are going to see a 30% cut in their quarterly income. Mm, it's gonna be really hard to justify them staying on board. But then again, AT&T's dividend is going to stay as one of the biggest dividends out there in the US. So it will still be a tough decision to sell out of AT&T. In this space, the competition between Verizon and AT&T is going to be mad. No one really knows how this is going to end up now. And after you've done your analysis on AT&T, you have to look at Warner Media and you've got to figure out, is this worth it? Warner Media is going to merge with Discovery, potentially bringing over 43 billion in debt. Discovery has about 15 million in debt and this company is going to be laden with around 50 billion in debt right out of the gate. However, it's coming with a hell of a lot of perks, both quantitative and qualitative. Discovery is a cable and streaming growth company that has been on the radars of lots of value investors pretty much in the past six months. And Discovery generates a tremendous amount of operating cash flow. Warner Media is going to bring over all that quality with HBO Max, and Discovery is going to bring over a lot of that crap television, you know, that people just put on in the background. I personally don't watch any of that stuff, but I know that a lot of women do. But I also know that all the random gold digging stuff and all the Food Network stuff is always on when I'm at work. I don't understand that, but it means a lot of people are watching it. Discovery also brings along this massive operating cash flow. They reckon they can inject about 20 million a year into content. While some of that will go back into the cable network, it is still spending a lot more than what Netflix is spending. And we introduced the new CEO of this company, David Zaslav. Apparently his friends call him Zaz and he's done very well at converting Discovery from a cable company into a streaming service. So he's got a very good idea of what he wants to place going forward. And everyone thought that Jason Keeler was gonna stop working, but he's decided to stay on at least until 2022. Believe it or not, Jason and Zaz have worked together previously, so they do know each other. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. I couldn't get into the politics there. What I do know though is that Keylar is compensated in stock, so I will be watching Jason Keylar's insider trading stuff really, really carefully. So we've got this new company that's gonna be about five times leverage. It's gonna be off to a bit of a limpy start, admittedly, but I think this deal qualitatively is going in the right direction. Right now we have hundreds of different streaming services. Not all of them are going to survive. Barely any of them are going to survive. It's very likely that within the next five to 10 years, there's only gonna be about five or six streaming services left. They're all gonna be sold or swallowed up by loads of different bigger services. Big news this week was Amazon brought MGM, so they're very much trying to increase their content quality as well. Obviously, Disney is a massive player, but what we should look out for now is companies like Comcast and ViacomCBS also doing similar deals to try and strengthen their own content. What I think we've got here with Warner Media and Discovery is we've merged two different types of content together to create one large one. There aren't a lot of those very specific types of deals left out there. Netflix, in my opinion, right now, doesn't look as strong as it used to. Of course, I do think it will always be one of the massive streaming services, but its place as number one now isn't guaranteed. And if you think a big growing streaming service can't cope with all that debt, think again. Netflix's debt to capital ratio is 54%. Netflix is laden with debt. Its credit rating has been junk bond status for a long time. So Netflix itself is proof that a high debt streaming service can be successful. 
So the reason why I'm not selling AT&T right now is because of all of the possible options that this merger is about to give to me. AT&T, as in the communications, broadband and wireless company, now has quite a few possible ways it can win. It can shore up its balance sheet by paying off some debt. It can also invest heavily into C-band, try and bring those prices down, try and increase the prices to its customers, and it can still win in that way. The dividend yield is still going to be very high, but there is going to be that little bit of a risk to investors with the psychology of the market here. It's going to be very volatile, possibly for a long time. Holding AT&T has always been a short-term pain, long-term gain idea for me, and it's always been one of the riskier assets in my portfolio. It's pretty much the only risky value play that I've ever actually taken on. And I've largely just wiped the money that I've invested in it right off my books. I pretty much don't even know it exists. And on the Warner Media side, the Warner Discovery side, the HBO Max side, I think there are so many ways that this company can win. It doesn't have to simply follow the US route. It's got the international route that's coming in June. This deal, in my opinion, has given Warner Media and HBO Max a lot of options to succeed. This company can now win in many different ways. The Discovery side is going to give a lot more access internationally and also is coming in as one single share unit. There's only going to be one single class of shares. This could allow much bigger companies with much bigger balance sheets to come in and propel HBO Max onto a much higher level. So my plan with AT&T right now is to hold on for a little bit and wait till it starts to drop back down to $26. Until then, I'm happy to hold and see where this share price takes me. But if it does drop down to that 26, 27 level again, I'll probably be buying a little bit more. Believe it or not, I'm quite happy with all the uncertainty that's going on within this business right now because I don't see any real negative ways or anything that's really changed with the entire business. I've always thought of AT&T and HBO Max as quite a separate identity. I think there's a lot more options. I think there's a lot more flexibility to this company now. And now I can visualize more ways for this company to win than it can lose. My portfolio is currently sitting at 27,731. Not a lot has changed recently, but there is one little thing that I want to change with KLA. KLA has been doing exceptionally for me recently, and I even added more very recently as well. However, we are starting to hit that sort of overvalued range, and it's very possible that I'm going to see a bit of a turnover in KLA's price. So I guess my question for you guys right now is, should I take profit? Should I be taking it out and putting it into something that's a little bit more undervalued, like Merck & Co maybe? Or should I just be leaving it in there and letting it ride? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching everyone. The investment app that I use is called Trading212. If you wanted to get into investing, you can sign up through a link in the description below. And if this company ever decides to open its doors again, then you can sign up and you'll get a free share. <laughs> Also feel free to check out our completely free Discord. There's lots of information and lots of stock sharing going on in there. And also feel free to check me out on Instagram. That is basically where I post all of the things that I'm buying that week. So if you're interested in that, feel free to jump on there. Thank you again for watching guys. And if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe and invest. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. The sucker's going up.